Community media is honored to celebrate not only Adams County, but the people who helped make this year special. So join us on our holiday edition of Adams County Unwrapped, where we highlight the outstanding accomplishments of individuals and nonprofits right here in Adams County. This season is all about coming together, showing gratitude and shining a spotlight on those who have made a remarkable impact through the year. So grab some hot cocoa, cozy up and join us as we unwrap the incredible achievements of our neighbors, friends and community. This is Adams County Unwrapped. Hey, it's Amy and thank you so much again for joining me for Adams County Unwrapped, which is a very special edition that we are putting out to the community regarding the people and nonprofits of Adams County, the impact they have made and the wonderful things they are doing. And today I have such a great guest. She is three-tiered amazing. She is not only an artist and author, but also an educator here in Adams County. So I'm so honored and privileged to bring Hannah Ray to the studio. Thanks for having me. Of course. So My big debut on is, television. This, it is your <laughs> first time? I think so. I don't remember another time. Well, I know that your art has been featured and your books a lot, but never? Never on television. Well, in the newspaper, yes. Well, we're gonna kick this off right. All right. So I mentioned the three things, artist, author, and educator. So tell us who you are. All right. So um, I guess I started out with writing because the classic story, and I have this on my website, is when I was in fourth grade, I could not fall asleep one night, and I walked down the hall to my parents' bedroom, and I stood at the door, and I was like, Mom, I can't sleep. And she was having no trouble sleeping, and she told me to make up a story in my head. So I did, and that was fourth grade. There were three characters. I only really remember two of them. They were based on my imaginary friends to start, Dino, Jajo, and Maggie. But then the main guy, his name was Kenny. I thought that was the coolest name at the time. I don't know why. And the girl was Sierra also. Very why? cool names. I, I thought so. <laughs> anyway, over the years, their names changed, and they have been Sebastian, Lucy, and Bert for as long as I can remember. And are they incorporated in your current writing? They're pretty much in everything. Like in Kick It One More Time, that one, it is the one that I, I wrote it multiple times. And um, I got, this is a funny story actually. I got to page 40. I was lifeguarding at the Lake Heritage Pool at the time. And I would get up early. I say early, it's probably 10, 9, 10. To, um, Summertime. Yeah, <laughs> early. yeah. And it, I was a teenager. So um, yeah. I'd get up early and go to my family's like desktop computer, and I'd type and type and type and type all morning be before I had to go to work, which was at noon. And um, yeah, I got to page 40, single space, size 12. So it was substantial for a teenager. And I realized I didn't know anything at all about what it was like to be in a band. And Sebastian Porter and Burt Robinson are both in a band. And so I wrote to a bunch of rock stars. And some of them did write back. And it was really nice that they did. But the rock star I wanted to hear from was Aaron Barrett of Real Big Fish. And so I reached out to him and through email. I had sent it in snail mail. And through email, he got back to me. And he's like, I never got this letter, but you could send it to my email, which was bigrockusa at hotmail.com at the time <laughs> and um, it was a lot of questions I think it was 53 questions that you posed to him so you could learn I how just, to write and, and build characters yeah to have characters in a band I felt that I needed to know what do you pack when you go on a tour bus and like does the band get along after you're on the road for X number of weeks did he and respond yeah I even asked this is my favorite question that I came up with as a teenager if you were playing an outdoor show and it's cold do you wear fingerless gloves or will that get in the way of playing guitar? That's a so, good question. I know. So 53 questions. He wrote back. It's 10 pages single spaced. He answered every single one of my questions and he sent it to me on Christmas Eve. You're kidding. No, it was very cool. Have you yeah. reached out to anybody else to get more about characters or to learn how to, because as an author, yeah. you really do have to do a lot of research. Yes. I do. Like, Sebastian gets injured in that book, and I did a lot of research on that injury and talked to a lot of people. The band stuff is the most fun stuff to research. That's what you're, you're passionate about music yeah, as well. Yeah, I really like music. I don't play an instrument or anything, but I do really like music. And so... So yeah. since the fourth grade, mm -hmm. even prior, you were very imaginative 
mm -hmm. and you lent that to writing for yep. your mother's request, which yeah. obviously turned out well. Mm -hmm. So you're an author, but then you're also an artist. Right. And an educator. Yes. And I'm sure the three of these. Oh, they go together beautifully. Complete. Tell yeah. me more about, then how did you get into art? So in art class, I, I've always loved art. And we did um, like some, it was cut paper, I guess. My friend Aaron and I did a cut paper assignment that we had to sort of think outside the box. We made this book called Would You Rather, where it was just illustrations of would you rather I'm trying to think of one that's not gross. <laughs> I remember I these, know. like, would you yeah. rather eat this or eat exactly. that? Exactly, and we would did you some rather... nasty ones, so I'm yeah. not going to say them. But, um, yeah, we did that, and I just really liked the medium. And so then I started to play around with it a little bit more. And, I mean, if you look at my early stuff, it's very elementary. And now, I mean, it's like cut and torn paper. I can hold this one up. This is absolutely oh, beautiful. Blue heron. How long does it take you to do each piece? It depends on the piece. This one took a long time. It was a focus. Uh, it was, like, when I say a long time, I don't do it so much in, like, I gauge my hours. It's when I can pick it, pick away at it when I come home from work. Mm -hmm. um, so it probably took maybe, like, three or four days, but that's me coming straight home from work and just sitting at my desk and, like, tearing paper wow. for hours, and then it gets dark, and I realize I should eat dinner. Yeah. It, it is a good idea. Yeah. So here's what I love about your mind. You're a lot like me where we can just envision and take and yeah. blend and mix. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the lines are very blurred between yeah. our minds. So now tell me just briefly, you're also an educator. Yeah. So I went to college for, I started out for art education. I realized I had this very cool professor who I asked him, how did you know you wanted to teach art? And he said, because the first thing I think about every morning when I wake up is art. And I said, the first thing I think about every morning when I wake up is writing. And he said, Hannah, you might be in the wrong major. So I switched my major to English, but I didn't add on the education. And then after college, I didn't know what to do. So I eventually went back and got my teacher intern certification and started teaching English. And it's like the best decision I made because one, it's way easier to find an English position than it is an art position. And two, you can do so much stuff in the classroom with art to incorporate it into lessons to keep kids engaged. Because I mean, the majority of the students I teach, English is not their favorite subject. Right. Yeah. It, and what you just said is absolutely true. You can bring the art into teaching English. Yeah. So, um, as you know, as an educator, people learn much differently mm -hmm. from one another. I'm extremely tactile, yeah. and I learn by touching and doing. Mm -hmm. And your art's very cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you just said that you had um, a college professor that highly impacted your decision mm -hmm. to go from an art major to an English major. Yes. Um, Adams County as we're highlighting here this Christmas season, has so many amazing individuals. So how has our community impacted what you do? So in my books, my books all go together. Um, the main, like I said, kick it one more time, that one is what I like to refer to as the center of the Hannah Ray literary universe. So it's got Lucy Bass and Bert in it, and they live in this fictional town called Lake Kaywood, which I grew up in Lake Heritage obviously in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And I basically wanted Gettysburg to have a lake that everybody could use. So I created this town called Lake Kaywood and named after the Kaywoods, whom I love. And they're like quintessential Lake Heritage people, you know? And yeah, so that town is Gettysburg, if Gettysburg had a lake. And I mean, sometimes I do things too. I really think this is fun. There's a coffee shop in Lake Kaywood, it's called Bottomless Joe's, which was a name that was in the running for the Ragged Edge when it opened. Really? Yeah, it was, the, there were two guys opening up, opening the coffee shop. One of them was obviously Jake Shindell, and Jake Shindell wanted it to be called the Ragged Edge, and that is what it is called. But I just thought Bottomless Joe's was such a cool name that I was like, Jake, can I use that for my fictional coffee shop? And he said yes. So that's what I did, but if you read the description of Bottomless Joe's, it is the Ragged Edge. I mean, they've got that cool garden outside. They've got the upstairs. I mean, it is an old house that's been turned into a coffee shop. They have the chalkboard menu overhead. So I'm learning this book really does 
encompass Gettysburg, yeah. the people, mm -hmm. the actual locations. Yeah. Okay, yeah. what else? Um, so there is also in, in this one, this is a prequel to it. It takes place 23 years before Kick It One More Time. And my, my other favorite coffee shop in town, I really like coffee, is Phantom Coffee Roasters, yeah. which is run by Alex and Chad. And I actually have two coffee owners, coffee shop owners, I should say, in that book, and their names are Alex and Chad. Um, yeah, because every time I go in there and I'm working on editing with my friend Mary, Chad will come in and say, did you put me into the book yet? Am I in the book? <laughs> so people know yeah. that you oh, write yeah. them yeah. in. He wanted, he wanted to be in the book, and he wanted his name in there, and he wanted more of a big part, but I was like, Chad, this is where you fit in for And now. a lot of your art is at Bantam Coffee Roasters oh, in yeah. Gettysburg. Yeah, they hang my stuff there. Um, I'm trying Are to other, would other people in the community read your books and recognize that they're in the books? I mean, I will do it if, if I have permission. Like okay. my friend Darren, I I have a character in the Christmas one who's a math professor, and he's a math professor. Okay. Um, yeah. So like that. And so you get inspiration from the town and the people you know. Yeah. Yeah. And there are definitely other places. I mean, the tavern is loosely based on the pub. Yep. And I'm trying to think, there there have been so many locations that I've made up over the years, but. If you if you walk through Gettysburg, if you've read about Lake Kaywood, I mean, there's one woman, her name's Sarah, who discovered my stuff at one of the book signings I had done at Bantam. And she said, like, I'm now her favorite author, which is really neat because I didn't have any connection to her before. Wow. She's a total stranger. But she had said to me, I want to live in Lake Kaywood. I want to be with these people. I want them to be my friends. And she also told me that the tavern has the best sweet potato fries, and she just wants to know where I got that idea. And I was like, well, I mean, I used to go to the pub a lot, and they had sweet potato fries, and they were really good. I haven't been to the pub for a while. I assume their sweet potato fries are still on the menu and still really good, though. I would, I would know. Yeah, would, <laughs> I, yeah. I love them, yes. <laughs> so I'm loving that um, you're not just using your ability to be an author to write out these really great stories, but you're connecting them back to the community that has really embraced you and is meaningful to you and has given you so much yeah. life yourself. Yeah. And like you said, your new favorite, Sarah, mm -hmm. who reads your books is now, you're her favorite author because what you're doing is the stories that she's reading about, mm -hmm. she has an opportunity to visit these places. Yeah. You know, yep. loosely based off of. Right. That's really cool. Sometimes I actually give him a shout out. Like the one character who owns Bottomless Joe's, he went to Gettysburg College and his name is Joe Abbott and he worked at the Ragged Edge, his favorite coffee shop. So I put it in there. There's another book that's written, but it's not released yet where um, Mr. G's is referenced. I of mean, I sent a screenshot of it to Mark McLean. He's like, oh my gosh, I love this. This really? is great. Yeah. So oh, I would never put it in really there cool if way. it was a negative thing or if I didn't have permission, but yeah. This is another great way just to highlight this town mm -hmm. and what we do. So the people in the locations have made a huge impact on your writing. Yeah. Um, I want to shift over as an educator. I know you have made a huge impact on your students. I was at your recent book signing, mm -hmm. and you had over a dozen, almost was, 20 students. I was really surprised at how many kids came out. It oh, was do, very cool. Do you see the impact that, that you provide to to these kids? I think so, yeah. Like, I mean, for example, if your mother in the fourth grade didn't say, go write a story in your head, mm -hmm. you, you might not have done that. So right. do you notice in your class from the beginning to the middle of the end of your time with these students how they've flourished with, yes. with your mentorship? Yeah, I don't want to take credit for all of that, but yeah. I, yes, I see that they do mm -hmm. grow and become even more awesome than they had been when they entered the room on that first day of school. And more than just educating in the classroom, you also have book clubs that your students can be a so part of? So we do in November. I have two students who have gotten really into, it's called NaNoWriMo. It stands for National Novel Writing Month. And so it just is the beginning of each word. And um, one of them is a senior this year. The other one is a sophomore. And last year, we did a NaNoWriMo club, and the goal of the club, and this is a national thing, I mean, mm -hmm. National Novel Writing Month. So you go on the website and everything, and you, 
your goal for the month of November is to write 50,000 words. And That's it's huge. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not really a full novel, but it's going to get you over that hump to get you to the full novel. And a lot of literary agents, they're looking for things that are only about 80,000 words anyway. So mm -hmm. it's not that far off. So yeah, during the month of November, I have kids come down to my room during our, our flex period, we call it, in the middle of the day, and we just brainstorm about what they're writing, and they can talk about problems they're having, and this coming Thursday, we always meet on Thursday, everybody is supposed to pick a paragraph that they've written that they're really proud of, and we're going to share that, but um, the student who's a senior, this I think will be her third novel that she's written, and she actually entered her first one in the Scholastic Writing Competition and got a key for it, which is a huge honor. And wow, yeah, they just they get really into it. And How could you not, especially knowing that your teacher mm -hmm. is yeah. a novelist? And yeah. how how many books do you have penned to your name? Six, six, six at this point in time. So you know the process, mm -hmm. you know how to do it. Yeah. And if a student shows that ambition or um, the abilities, mm -hmm. you are there. Yeah. Was this club? prior to you being there, or is this something you kind of created? This is only our second year doing it. And you're yeah. heading this up? Yeah, with the help of those two students. So that's yeah. giving back to our community right then and there. Mm -hmm. What would they yeah. have done otherwise? Written on their own. And maybe yeah, not... struggled through it, or? Yeah, I mean, they, they're they pretty amazing kids, but it is fun to watch them interact with their peers, because you know the two who, who helped me lead it, they I mean, they're going to write regardless. They have this inner drive. But then there are some other kids who come. I had one student say to me, I don't know how this club works, but if you guys need an idea, I have one. I was like, well, that's your idea. You're going to bring it to the table, and you're going to be the one to write it, not us. Like, it's your idea. So he came, and now he's writing a novel. That is so Steve. important that our ideas can be shared and heard mm -hmm. yeah. and accepted. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to say that anybody's idea is a bad one, you know, and the right. more you write, the better you're going to be. So even if, if, even if these guys are starting out writing something and they get to 40,000 words and then they look at it and they think, this is terrible, they still wrote 40,000 words, Yeah, you know, and it's the first draft, it's fine. And then that brings it on over to how you implement your art with education in English, because like you said, yeah. some kids like, hey, this isn't my strong subject. Right. So how do you implement those together? Um, sometimes we do like really basic things like coloring sheets. Mm -hmm. It's not just they color, but right. they will have answers that they need to find, and then they coincide with a number on the sheet, and mm -hmm. so they're sort of reading and finding answers and coloring as they go. Sometimes it's really intricate artsy assignments that require them to go into the text and then not only respond in a short constructed response, but to also do it with art and make their answer visual. Sometimes while they, like we might play a chapter and they can listen to it instead of reading and they'll do sketch notes as they, as they listen. That's really important to get the right and the left brain working together yeah. and some through kids art. Just, I mean, they, they don't picture it when they read I, I'm somebody who I'm very visual, and mm -hmm. obviously. And so <laughs> yes. um, when, I, when I'm reading something, I see it in my head, and I always assumed, I know not everybody does that, but I always assumed that people who write did that. Mm -hmm. But just recently on social media, I saw something that John Green, you know, who wrote An Abundance of Catherines and The Fault in Our Stars and they Looking don't for Alaska. They do see it. He doesn't see it. Right. I thought that was fascinating. I didn't know that either. Because he he writes imagery very well. Yeah. So the fact that he's not seeing what he's writing is astounding to me. So it's just bringing back into how people learn differently yeah. and how they comprehend. And I think now more than ever, it's extremely important to take some inner dialogue and be able to express it. Mm -hmm. And we have um, multiple ways we can do that, and some people do it in other ways. Yeah. You do it in what I consider to be the most fascinating three ways, which is literature, mm -hmm. actual art to yeah. visual, and then the, the teaching. That's... Yeah, it's fun. You're, it's you fun should combo. be very proud of yourself. And well, I'm sure... You. So I asked you how the community has impacted your writing and your art, and a little bit about how I believe you've been able to impact mm -hmm. your students and 
Let's go back to the art. Tell me okay. why, when somebody buys a piece of your art, what is the impact you want them to take away or the feeling they're gonna take away with that piece of art? Well, it's gonna be different for every single person, but one of my favorite stories about a piece of art is one of my coworkers, mother had passed away a couple years ago now, and I do a lot of cardinals. This is cardinal, right? Yes. Yeah, so the cardinals because just whistle like ties in with cardinals and yeah, so I do a lot of cardinals and I think I'd had a show or else I was hanging my stuff at Bantam at the time, but the cardinals sold, the cardinals always sell out. And my coworker came to me and asked if I would do a commission and I did, because I like to make cardinals. And when I delivered it to her, she, like, she was so overcome. She started to cry. She asked if she could give me a hug. I said, absolutely. But I mean, she was just so touched to have that artwork because it reminded her so much of her mom. So, and again, that's a visual component that yeah. some people don't have that ability. Yeah. So by having art that you can create reconnects them. Yeah to very, very special moments. Yeah. And each one of these, yeah, these is are, kind of special to you. They're kind of fun, because um, the art show that I have coming up at the Gary Owen, it will hang, I, I don't know, in the past they've always hung for three months, so I'm assuming it's gonna be about the same. So it goes up in December, and then it should hang. But this time around, I decided to do a theme of my books, because it's one of those things, like I make the covers, and sometimes people, like, like Biz, she always says, um, don't you have a map? Don't you have a map of the towns? But I don't have a map of the towns because I don't, I'm not a map person. I'm very bad at directions. Thank goodness <laughs> so for GPS. So that's not one of those things that I'm going to ever make as a map. But I do like certain scenes. So um, in like a flip turn, there's a scene with like, should I just hold this up? Yeah. Like Ruby Gallagher is the old woman who lives on this hill. And there's a little girl named Lydia who sees her house from the other side of the lake in Lake Kaywood aka Gettysburg. And so I, I thought this was, this is the vision that she sees. So that was fun to make because I'd never made Ruby's house before, but I posted it on my Instagram page and I had many people say, oh my gosh, that's Ruby's house. That looks just like Ruby's house. And I think that's really important. These books are just filled, you know, with the words in your, in your they mind. Are, they just, are filled with the words. Just filled with the <laughs> words. And, and as you're reading this, your mind can, can go, but like yeah. we just mentioned, there are some people that don't have the ability to grasp that image. Yeah. So by creating these wonderful pieces of art mm -hmm. helps them connect the yeah. dots a little it's bit. Fun. And it's they can fun. hang in their home. They can hang in their homes. Yeah, this one was cool because it's, it's from Just Whistle. And the, Just Whistle tells the story of two people, their name, well, three people actually. Charlie is a girl moving back to the area. Julie is a handyman, it's short for Julian. And then there's Addison, who is a, a young boy, who they all kind of had like the opposite of gender of what you would expect their name to be. And um, Charlie comes back because her grandfather has passed away and he's, she's gotta like pack up this farmhouse, but she decides to keep it and renovate it and turn it into a brewery because her grandfather always grew hops and he loved to brew beer. And it's called the brew ha ha, but there's, love it. there's a magical element. Like I write magical realism. So there's always at least a magical element. And the magical element there is that the house has rooms that come and go. So the floor plan is constantly changing. And if you are sitting on the, the brew ha ha's front porch, there's like, there's a barn that's out there. And that would be where Petey Good is brewing the beer. And um, the dogs, Julie and, and Charlie's dogs, Scarlet and Rhett, Hence love, love story. Yep. Yeah, so that house, that whole area though is based on my grandparents' farmhouse growing up. So that's pretty much like what I looked out on. And I was so pleased how it came together when I made it. Like that's another one that took a long time to make, but I had so much fun. It's I went beautiful. through about 15 X-Acto blades. I mean, really? it, it was a lot of cutting, a lot of cutting paper. So there's yeah. multiple ways that art can come into fruition and you can express yourself. Mm -hmm. I think we've all gone into stores or read books where it's so wonderful and overpowering. You think, oh, I, I, could, I could never do that. Yeah. What, what advice do you have for your students who walk into the room that you're, you're doing your, your writing expose or you're at an art show and somebody comes to you like, this is so amazing. 
what are the first steps to writing or art or expression? I think the first step is to get it down on paper or canvas or whatever it might be. Because in the NaNoWriMo Club, the thing that continues to come up is, and I used to do this too, um, you'll start to write and then you have to stop because everybody gets to a stopping point. But then you go back and you look at what you wrote and you edit it and you think, this is terrible, I have to start over. Or you go through and you edit it to make it better and then you continue to go back and eventually you have 25 or 30 pages and so every time you sit down you're going back and you're starting out by ridiculing yourself and saying well this isn't good enough this is never going to be anything and when I wrote Kick It One More Time that book's very long but I had a lot to say and I mean that story's been in my head since I was in fourth grade pretty much so I had to write that book like once I got that book out it took years and years and years to write that book everything that I've written since then has been a piece of cake by comparison. I think that's really important too, that it doesn't just happen overnight. No. So if somebody is stuck or they're feeling frustrated or it's not good enough, mm -hmm. it took you how long to write this? You said years. Yeah, I started trying to write it when I was a teenager, probably around 15 or 16, and I think I wrote the first and f wrote and completed the first draft of it when I was maybe in my early 20s. So, years. Yeah, and then I wrote it a couple different times. That's really the only one I've written that has multiple drafts. And then from this, you kind of have those aha moments of what worked, mm -hmm. and then you felt accomplished. Yeah. So you said these took quicker. Yeah, yeah, and I actually, I published these two before I ever published that one. Like really? that one just means the most to me because it's, like I said, it's the center. It's the center of everything. Everything branches off of it. And I love that book. That is so great. And I just love that you can reiterate back to anybody, student to adult, mm -hmm. art and writing, there isn't a, an exact perfection. It's no. just let it flow. Yeah. Because inside of each and every one of us, we have our own ideas and expression. And whether it's art through cutting paper that's time consuming and mm -hmm. laid out in a way, or drawing, or writing, yeah. or clay, whatever that is, mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and it's so cool to see what resonates with people. My, like my mom and I are actually gonna play this game because I've been stockpiling a whole bunch of pieces to hang at Gary Owen, and I'll show her pieces, and she's like, Hannah, you need to get prints of that, cause, or you need to make a whole bunch more because that's gonna sell out. And I'm like, I don't think it will. And then, really? Yeah. Because most, I mean, I shouldn't say this because now I'm on TV, but most of the time when my mom tells me something's going to sell out, it doesn't. <laughs> but this, this other stuff, I'm like, the Cardinal's going to sell, Mom. Yeah. I just, that one doesn't do it for me. That one isn't, and that's what she says to me. And I'm like, well, but it's I love like, I have three people who are kind of like going at it right now. Like, I want that one. And that just plays back into yeah. how people visualize art yeah. and, and what it looks like to them. And mm -hmm. I can't express enough to young children, and you probably get this all the time at school, that, oh, I'm not good enough, or mine's not as good as. Yeah. And we have to just stop that, because mm -hmm. everyone sees and hears things in such a special, magical, yeah. unique way. And if you didn't put this down, you know, mm -hmm. what? where would it, it would just live forever. Just be taking up more space in my head. Taking up more space, yeah. and now we all get to be in your, your yeah. head with this yeah. space. So you were telling me how you inspire your Try students yeah, yeah, through these different things. What else do you do to really um, give them a more, how do I use this word? When you inspire your students, not just in the classroom, but like I said, when I went to your book signing, yeah. you had students there. Yeah. So I, I did invite them, and I have invited them to the Gary Owen art show as well because I think it's, like, they all know, if they say to me, Ms. Beeson, if you could have one wish in the whole entire world, what would it be? And I'm like, to have a book deal? I want a book deal. And they are astounded by this. And they're like, well, have you written books? And I'm like, they're in the school library. You can borrow them. But when I was doing this book signing, I, I randomly said, do you want to come to my book signing? And then all those kids showed up, which was really neat. Yeah. And so I've also told them about Gary Owen, and I'm hoping that some of them will show up there too, but I just think it's really important for them to see that that is my goal. Like, I love teaching, 
and I think I'm okay at it. You know, I do a <laughs> decent job, and I really like interacting with the students. I mean, they are very fun. You never know what is going to come out of their mouths. They keep a person young. Sometimes <laughs> I think they make me old, but most of the time they keep me young. And um, I just think it's really neat to have them at a setting where it's outside the classroom, outside the school completely. They're seeing me do something that I love, but knowing that they could do it too. Like there's nothing holding them back in anything, whether it's books or art or math or travel or anything. Like I just think it's good for them to see somebody else I don't want to say struggle, because in this case, the struggle is hard, but like putting in the effort to get to where I want to be. And, and not being afraid to just yeah, try. And seeing the steps that one has to take. Like it's not going to be overnight. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that that happens overnight for anybody. And even somebody who appears to have that overnight thing, it's usually like 12 years in the making. Yeah. You know? So they don't see. And I like that also, because in the classroom, you're their biggest fan watching them progress and yeah. do well and, and make those shifts in their life. And then they get to turn that around and come and be your fan yeah, outside fun. of the classroom. And I remember when I was younger and I would see a teacher outside the classroom, it was like avoidance technique yeah. and like, oh my gosh, they have a life. But then they come up to you on the first, like the first day back and go, hey, I saw you at Marshall's. Yeah, like, I know, I, I said hi, you went like this. Yeah. Yeah. So it, ever kids. since you're little, seeing a teacher outside the classroom yeah. setting has always been this mystery. Mm -hmm. And you're inviting them to be a part of this yeah. process because it lends to everything that, that you teach yeah. and create in your mind with a literature. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you constantly give back. So Thanks. the books are available where? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, they also are at, there are a couple copies at the Ragged Edge, and there are several copies at Bantam Coffee Roasters. Okay. But all of them are on Amazon. And this one, like a flip turn, um, just recently came out as an audio book. Oh, really? And, yeah, and Kick It One More Time will be released as an audio book probably in December. The one you're with will be an audio in December, and at some point, I have another one, I didn't bring it, but it's called The Way Back, and that's also coming in as an audio book at some point. And these are so cool to, it, in audio form when you're traveling and driving yeah. around, especially during the holidays, going to the different, just pop it in yep. and listen to it. And when you're listening to it, you're going to be able to click with, oh, okay, I know, where, I know where that is. Yeah. Might sound like somebody I know. And your <laughs> art, I have seen at Bantam Coffee Roasters yep, in Gettysburg. all the time. And It'll then soon be at Gary Owen. It'll be at Gary Owen, yes, for Excellent. at least two months, probably three. And probably online? Um, so I have it on my website. I don't have it. I used to have an Etsy shop, but I took it mm -hmm. down. It was just too much work. So yeah, people can contact me through my website about art. It's absolutely yeah. beautiful. And what you're looking at here are some small pieces, but you have some extremely yeah. big, like the octopus. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you have a line of animals, cats, dogs. Mm -hmm. Uh, just the variety is yeah, everything. All sorts of stuff. So it's not just the, the books. No, this is just the theme for this show. It's, yeah. Yeah, Bantam Coffee Roasters has a lot of chickens because. Yes, the Bantam. You know, chickens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is really great. I'm excited to see you out and about and watch you flourish and do Thank more. You. And um, again, I, I really appreciate it. And for all the students who are watching you and excited to watch your progress. What's the wrap-up inspiration you would say to any student watching of you can do it? Yeah, I would just say if, if you want something, you can make it happen and do not be discouraged. Like, keep going. If you're on page 10, make it to page 11. If you are halfway through a canvas, finish it up. Like, you've got this. And art looks different to everybody and embraced in different ways. Yep. Yep. So, absolutely. I, I love knowing you as a person, I love as knowing a friend, you. and Thanks. an author, an artist, and an educator here in Adams County. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having Adams me. Adams County Unwrapped and highlighting how you give back through inspiration and to our youth by being an educator and helping them realize that all of this 
can happen as well. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank well, you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us and for everything Hannah Ray. We'll get the details right after this. So be sure to show up to some of her pop-up locations. And of course, always Bantam Coffee in Gettysburg has her art on the wall. You can also get some books. And for a short time, Gary Owen right in Gettysburg as well. Thanks so much and happy creating. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.